All right, welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the 22nd webinar in the eighth week in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, that's N-O-A-A, -A, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Vera Trainer. She's with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in understanding the importance of phytoplankton in the oceans, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. Vera comes to us from the land of the Duwamish, the first people of Seattle. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. And if you want to know why we do Indigenous land acknowledgements at the beginning of our webinar, please check out the NOAA Live webpage to learn more there. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line, almost 200 people today, and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go, and I will be keeping track for Vera. We'll pause every now and then to take a few. We may not get to all your questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. And we are so excited to have Vera here today. So Vera, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you to everyone who's joined me today. So what I wanna to talk to you about is the ocean's microscopic world. And the word microscopic just means in order to see the organisms, in order to see these tiny living creatures, you really need to use a microscope. And so that's the picture you see here, is a picture that was taken under a microscope of some beautiful creatures that live in the sea. But first, let's see if I can get to the next slide. But first, I wanna tell you a little bit about me. And you see the two pictures here on the left. This is me with my mom at the beach in New Jersey. So those of you on the East Coast, I used to live there. I used to live in Pennsylvania, very close to Philadelphia. So this is a picture of me at the beach with my mom right here. And then here is a picture of me hiking with my mom. And my mom is from Germany originally. So here we are hiking in the Alps, which are the mountains in Germany. But I wanted to point out, here's some pictures of me now. These two people happen to be my kids. So I'm not only a scientist, I'm also a mom. And they were very good to me on Mother's Day. Here's a picture of me on the bottom hiking in the beautiful mountains of New York State called the Adirondacks. And here is me now as a scientist. I'm really lucky to, to work for NOAA. And I, and I work for NOAA in Seattle, Washington, all the way on the other side of the United States. But before I moved from Philadelphia to Seattle, I went to school in Miami at the University of Miami to study marine science. Okay, but enough about me. Let's learn something about these cool microscopic organisms. But first, I want you guys to maybe close your eyes and think about a beautiful place by the ocean. Maybe you've gone with your parents or your brother or your sister, and we've all been kind of cooped up in our houses for a while. Think of a beautiful sight by the sea and it's a really hot day and you're getting ready to jump in. Okay, you all ready to jump? Okay, jump in the water. Here you are, now you're swimming in the beautiful water. Maybe you're snorkeling at a coral reef, but oh my gosh, you're getting even smaller and smaller and you're becoming as small as some of the tiny creatures. Here you go. 
And this is what some of those creatures look like. They're so beautiful. And I wanna to talk to you more about some of those very small creatures that maybe sometimes when you're swimming, you might even drink by accident. So what do you think plankton are? A, a heavy piece of flat wood. B, tiny creatures living that float, tiny creatures that float in the sea. C, eggs floating in the sea. Or D, jellyfish. Okay, I am getting a flood of responses here, Vera, and I don't think you tricked anybody. Everybody is saying it's B. Uh, I can't find any other answers. We are getting an abundance of B. <laughs> hey, you guys are all right. You've been listening. So these are tiny living creatures that float in the sea, and sometimes we say microscopic organisms. And the word organism just means living thing. So you could say to your cat, oh, you're an organism, or even your mom and dad, oh, you guys are organisms. So it's kind of a cool word to know. So we say plankton are microscopic organisms that live in the sea. Okay, so let's move on. And I wanna tell you a little bit more about the invisible watery world. And here's some cartoons of what some of the phytoplankton might look like. But there aren't just phytoplankton. Pl phytoplankton are the plant-like organisms in the sea, but also zooplankton, which you see here at the top, zooplankton, which are animal-like. Well, these animal-like creatures are about two millimeters in size. And you go, two millimeters, two millimeters, what is that? Well, two millimeters is about the size of the head, a head of a pin. And then phytoplankton or the plant-like organisms in the sea are about a thousand times smaller than zooplankton. And you go a thousand times, geez, that is really, really small. Well, what is a thousand times smaller than something else? Well, an ant is a thousand, about a thousand times smaller than an elephant. So again, a phytoplankton is a thousand times smaller than a head of a pin. So do you think you could see these with your naked eye? And All right, the let's see. What do you think, guys? Um, we are getting a lot of no's, Vera. Let's see. No, 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 no. Everyone seems to agree it's no. Paige and Liam and James and Chris. Uh, Juan says no. Everybody's everybody's pretty sure you can't see them with your naked eye. Okay, guys. So this was kind of a trick question. So sometimes, yes, you can see them with your naked eye, but you were basically right. Individual phytoplankton you can't see with your naked eye. When can we see them? Well, sometimes they are found in such high numbers in water that you're able to actually see groups of them called a phytoplankton bloom. So they can make what we call colonies or aggregates that can change the color of the water. And look at some of these pictures. Have you ever seen this colored water before? Or maybe you've seen some foam at the beach. And I've heard people say, oh, I think that's pollution. Well, it's not, oh, it's often not pollution. In fact, it's really super high numbers of phytoplankton in the water. So much like dandelions that can bloom in our yards or flowers that bloom on the bush, there are phytoplankton that can bloom in the sea. So at times we can see them with our eye. And in fact, even though they're so small, they're microscopic, as we've said before, we can see them from space. And you heard Kara Wilson talk at one of the previous seminar series about how you can see the ocean from space. Well, because of the color that phytoplankton produce, you can sometimes see them. And here in the circle, you see some of the beautiful shapes and sizes of the phytoplankton. So I think now we're gonna take a few questions. Great, thanks Vera. And we do have a few. 
Um, so a few weeks ago, we had a colleague, um, a NOAA colleague of yours from Seattle named Peter Murphy talking about marine debris. And one of our um, kids today, Kathy, wants to know, can plankton eat plastic? Mm, that's a very good question. I think we know that some bacteria can break down plastic or eat certain types of plastic. I, I, I don't know whether phytoplankton can eat plastic. I, as far as digesting plastic, I think it would probably pass through most phytoplankton. But it's known that bacteria can, in fact, digest plastic, making it into smaller particles or actually changing the form of plastic. Great. Uh, good answer. Um, let's see. Jackie, I think this was at the very beginning from your title slide. She wanted to know, is it bad to swallow seawater? For the most part, Jackie, it's really not going to hurt you. You might start coughing and you get a little bit too much salt in your body, but these small creatures are just going to pass through your stomach, out of your gut, and you're just going to pass them through. They're not going to cause any harm. <laughs> That's funny to think about plankton passing through you. Um, okay, we have a lot of kids who want to know what the these are just standard questions on all of our webinars. So, for example, James wants to know, what's the smallest plankton ever recorded? The smallest plankton are really in the range of micron or less. So remember, we talked about millimeters and things that are a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. Plankton are, are basically in the micron range, so a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. Wow, that's pretty small, don't you think, James? Um, Liam wants to know, can plankton become fossilized? Well, that's a very good question. In fact, a lot of scientists study the fossil records of plankton to see how much the ocean has changed over time. And if you, if you look here in the circle, you'll see some organisms, they have these, it's almost like a shell, like this particular organism has a shell. This particular one that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more has a shell. And these shells will last for a really long time. Not every plankton is able to last in the fossil record, but many do, and they help us study the history of the ocean. Good question. That is a good question. Okay, I'm gonna hold the rest of these so we can get back to your presentation and then I'll accumulate some next ones for the break. Okay, so perfect. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going, okay. And now it's time for us to take two deep breaths, everybody. Okay, and I'm gonna do it with you. One. Two. Now, you can thank the phytoplankton for that second breath. Why do you think that is? Why should we care about phytoplankton? A, they produce as much oxygen as trees. B, because they are beautiful. C, we can make blackboard chalk from them. D, we can make windows out of them. Or E, all of the above. What do you guys think? Okay, Rebecca thinks it's E or A. Um, let's see, a lot of A's. Paige definitely thinks it's A. I got it, Paige. Um, let's see, Sage thinks it's A and B. Um, Brian says E. Um, all people, some people are changing their answers, moving to E. Um, Duncan thinks it's A. Um, yeah, lots of A's and E's. Well, you guys are right. It's actually E, and I'm gonna explain why now through the next set of slides. So phytoplankton in the sea, you may have heard about the process of photosynthesis. And this is where the marine phytoplankton, and here we see some beautiful images of them again, are able to take up, or we say assimilate water, and carbon dioxide 
and through the process of photosynthesis, make oxygen. So in many ways, the phytoplankton are like an invisible forest, and they produce over half of the world's oxygen. So every second breath that you take, you really should thank the phytoplankton. So your parents might think you're a little silly if you go around the house going, thank you, phytoplankton. Thank you, phytoplankton. And in fact, phytoplankton are so important. I'm sure you guys have heard about global warming or climate change, but through that process of taking up carbon dioxide, these phytoplankton are able to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and in fact create oxygen and sugars from them. So we should thank the phytoplankton for helping to fight climate change. So here's an example of my part of the world. I live in Seattle, which is right about here, right about here. And this is, you can see here, this little body of water is called Hood Canal. And a phytoplankton bloom, which we just learned about from space, looks like this. It has this beautiful, beautiful bluish color. And this is what the water looked like from land and again, from the sky. So this gorgeous turquoise blue, what causes that color to be formed in the water? Well, it's this amazing organism called a coccolithophore. And here you see in the circle, a picture, a microscopic picture of a coccolithophore. And each one of these little plates is called a coccolith. Well, if any of you guys have ever been over to England, you'll know that there's this famous place that maybe you would visit as a tourist called the White Cliffs of Dover. Well, the White Cliffs of Dover are basically formed out of all many, many, many millions and millions and millions of coccolithophore shells, which are soft white chalk called calcium carbonate. And here again, you can see a picture of a coccolithophore bloom from space with this beautiful, beautiful white color. So chalk is primarily calcium carbonate, which comes from coccolithophores. Hmm, so what else comes from coccolithophores? It's, or it's, is made of calcium carbonate. Well, maybe you guys, when your stomach has been upset, your parents have given you this. Pepto-bismol is formed of calcium carbonate. So the very same thing, the very same chemicals that are used to make coccolithophore shells, or I should say coccolithophores use them to make their shells, is something that might be found in a very common medicine. And also blackboard chalk has been, it is, blackboard chalk is made from calcium carbonate as well. So these phytoplankton are not just useful, but also very beautiful. And here's some pictures. This is beautiful artwork that was formed by a, Ger a German uh, artist, Ernest Haeckel, in 1904. So he looked in the microscope and drew these very beautiful pictures because he was so inspired by their gorgeous shapes and forms. And you can see some of them look almost eerie. Some of them look almost a little bit scary. But do you think you could be inspired by some of these pictures? Maybe you could draw some cartoons or you could draw some beautiful pictures with an inspiration from phytoplankton. So in the light microscope, this is an example of some of the phytoplankton that you would see. These are pictures of phytoplankton called diatoms, and they are unique because they have silica cell walls. Maybe some of you have heard of silica, which is one of the elements in our periodic tables, one of the elements that forms many structures in, in, on this earth. So let's see why we care about silica. Why should we care about diatoms? 
Well, we make windows out of silica. We make toothpaste out of silica. It's that sort of abrasive feeling that toothpaste has. And hmm, what is this? It's some sort of electronic. Well, our microwaves, our cell phones, and our computers have elements of silica in them. So can you imagine a world without diatoms? A world without silica where we had none of these things? So here are some tools that we use to identify phytoplankton. And this is a very um, expensive and high tech piece of equipment called a scanning electron microscope that you see right here on the left. I lost my pointer, oops. And so this particular instrument can magnify organisms from 400 to 20,000 times. And you can see some of the examples here of the different magnification of phytoplankton. So you can see some of the very fine scale holes or what we call pores in the phytoplankton. And so this is an example of, a cre of many creatures that can be seen in the scanning electron microscope. And on the left there, you see your familiar phytoplankton called the coccolithophore with its beautiful plates called coccoliths. So I think we're gonna take a break now, right, Nicole, to answer a few more questions? Yeah, I've got some here. This is a good place to stop. Um, so <laughs> um, someone would love to know, and I don't know if it's Sophia or Olivia, but what kind of plankton is the plankton from SpongeBob? Do you have any idea? Well, actually, yes. Plankton from SpongeBob is a zooplankton. And I believe he's a copepod. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about zooplankton in this talk, but you could look up on the web, copepod, and you'll see some similarities between SpongeBob or between plankton and a copepod. I, I stand corrected. I had no idea that SpongeBob was, <laughs> was a specific plankton in that. So you heard it here first, kids, zooplankton. Um, so let's see, um, we asked about the smallest plankton ever recorded. You talked about those being measured in microns. Um, what about the biggest plankton? Nate would like to know. Well, that's a really good question. And I'm going to actually show a picture of one phytoplankton uh, species called Noctiluca. And if you collect it in a jar of water and you look and you hold it up to the light and you look at it with your naked eye, you can actually see it. So the largest phytoplankton are in fact like a couple of millimeters. They're almost as big as some of the zooplankton. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, some of these questions I know you're gonna get to, so I'm gonna skip over a few of those. Um, did you already talk about how many species of phytoplankton there are? Well, that's that's a really good question. And, you know, scientists are still discovering more and more, but we're in the tens of thousands of species of phytoplankton. Wow, that is a lot. Um, let's see. Oh, JC wanted me to ask, as soon as we took that break, why do we think phytoplankton for the second breath and not the first? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's it's. It's a one way of saying we're thanking them for 50% of the oxygen. So it's not really the second breath that you're taking. It's just a way for you guys to maybe remember that half of the oxygen on this planet is thanks to the phytoplankton. So good question. <laughs> These are sharp kids. You can't get anything by them, I'm telling you. Um, okay, so we had a question from Duncan and also kind of relates to um, Michael had asked a similar question. You know, how did you get your job? How, how did you get interested in it? That, that's a really good question. And, and in fact, I moved to Seattle 
at, well, I was a student at University of Miami and I wrote a letter to a professor whose research paper I had read. <clears throat> and at the time I was a graduate student, he invited me to come and study in his lab at University of Washington for a month to do some experiments. And I really fell in love with Seattle. So I, I finished my PhD, my doctorate, and then I came back to Seattle. And then a job opened up and I was able to work for NOAA. So it was sort of a combination of writing letters, being in touch with people, and then being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people that helped me get my job in Seattle. Wow, that's great. I like that story. Um, we, I'm gonna ask you one more question. Um, Juan would like to know, do phytoplankton give birth or do they lay eggs? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Well, the phytoplankton, they can either divide and they can reproduce through what's called asexual reproduction, or in fact, there are female and male phytoplankton that are really hard to tell apart, but there can be mating also in phytoplankton. So um, yeah, they're very diverse. They can they can divide, or in fact, they can they can reproduce. All right. Well, that's a good place to continue on. I'll I'll continue to collect more questions. Thanks, Vera. All right. Thanks, Nicole. So some phytoplankton make toxins, okay, or poisons, and and what scientists think is that they make these poisons so that zooplankton won't eat them. So here you see on the left the zooplankton that in fact can eat the phytoplankton that can make these chemicals that in some cases are poisonous to us. And some of you may have heard about harmful algal blooms. Well, in fact, these are phytoplankton that can make chemicals that are poisonous to people. They're, they're not poisonous to the phytoplankton, they have some function. And in fact, one of the functions or one of the reasons why they make them is that zo so that zooplankton will not eat them. But this is a very, very small proportion of all of the phytoplankton that can produce some of these harmful substances. But some phytoplankton can make these poisons and then form blooms. They can change the color of the sea that cause damage then to tourism, which we, we saw some pictures earlier of some phytoplankton blooms. And in fact, they can in some places cause fish deaths. And I've been hearing about some fish kills in Southern California right now that are due to phytoplankton blooms. So here's an example of a phytoplankton bloom in Australia. This one is, is not poisonous, but in fact, it can cause damage to tourism. And this was found in Australia and is an example of a phytoplankton bloom. This particular organism, phaeocystis, it can form these sort of mucousy colonies that make this foam. And then here's the one, we got the question about how large can some phytoplankton be? Well, this is the one, if you collect it and you look in a, in a jar of water, you can actually see it. It's, it. It reaches sizes of a couple of millimeters, and this is called noctiluca. A noctiluca bloom in Puget Sound. This is another type of phytoplankton bloom. And in fact, sometimes when we take a ferry across to one of the islands here in Puget Sound, sometimes people will say, oh, the ocean looks like tomato soup. And that's because of these noctiluca blooms. So phytoplankton poisons can be transferred up the food chain. So we have on the left, the toxin producing phytoplankton, also called harmful algal bloom. Um, and then we have filter feeders like mussels, clams, in some cases, sardines that eat the phytoplankton. Then we are the predators. We are the ones that can eat the shellfish or sometimes sardines, and as well as marine mammals can eat them. 
And then very, very rarely there is illness or even sometimes death from these phytoplankton blooms. And the process of these toxins moving up the food chain is called bioaccumulation. But harmful algae are much less than 2% of all phytoplankton and shellfish safety is protected by the various state health departments here in Washington. It's the Washington State Department of Health and scientists like me, we have spent our careers protecting public health and studying harmful algal blooms. So what's in that mouthful of seawater, everyone? Is it A, dirt, B, plankton, C, cardboard, or D, marbles? Okay, everybody, let's see. See if you were paying attention. Um, we B, obviously, says Jackie. Um, <laughs> Everyone seems to agree that it's B. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Juan. Are we right? Yes, we are right. Great. So, good job, everybody. I made that one pretty easy, but thanks to the phytoplankton, you can breathe, and, but every once in a while when we swim in the ocean or even a lake, we might swallow some plankton. So I wanted to thank you guys for listening in today. I think science is really super cool. You know, think back to me when I was at the New Jersey beach with my mom. I just, I loved going to the beach. I loved really looking at very small things and it really inspired my choice, my decision to go into science. So I hope you guys stay interested in science. And if we have time, Nicole, we have a special treat for you guys. Yeah, that we do have time. We're looking great on time. And um, I have a bunch of questions. So keep thinking of questions and Vera is gonna show you something pretty cool. So Vera, you wanna go to your, under your sharing um, menu um, and you should be able to access the video from there. There you go. Now, is there a way to make it big? Uh, everyone should be able to just click on click on the full screen mode. And then in the bottom left, you want to hit the little play button. Here we go. You ready, everyone? Have you thanked Plankton recently? You haven't, have you? No one ever does. It's not like they're not adorable. There's bacteria, algae, jellyfish, teensy baby crabs. Basically anything that drifts around with the ocean currents can be called plankton. They're so photogenic that a book's just come out filled with pictures of them. But they don't just float around all day looking pretty. It turns out plankton are keeping us all alive. So start your thank you notes now because here are five reasons to thank plankton. Number one, air. Everyone loves trees. Trees fill the air with oxygen and stop global warming and save the planet. So how come no one mentions that photosynthetic plankton, like these diatoms, produce as much oxygen as all the rainforests and land plants put together? And absorb carbon dioxide? And slow down climate change? Oh, and they've been doing it for three billion years. <laughs> Take that, trees. Thanks, plankton. Number two, fuel. Here's another thing trees get all the credit for, fuel. You can chop them down as firewood or dig their remains up as coal. But the world's biggest energy source is oil. And can you guess what most of that precious, precious oil is made from? What a surprise, it's plankton. Single-celled creatures like diatoms and dinoflagellates die and sink to the sea floor, where they're crushed and transformed over millions of years into oil and natural gas. Sure, dead trees contribute some of it, but the plankton had a three billion year head start, making them the world's largest supplier of fossil fuels. So much for saving the planet. Thanks, plankton. Number three, rocks. When we're not burning plankton's remains for fuel, we're building houses from them. From St. Paul's Cathedral to the Great Pyramids, some of our favorite chunks of rock were once at the bottom of the sea. Hard shells, like on these foraminifera, fall to the ocean floor and end up cemented into sedimentary rocks. 
chalk is basically entirely plankton. So what have we learnt? That's right, plankton rocks. Thanks, plankton. Number four, fish fingers. OK, so maybe you can technically survive without fish fingers. Or salmon, sushi, mussels, tuna mayo sandwiches. OK, let's just say you're vegetarian. The point is, all sea creatures, delicious or otherwise, depend on plankton somewhere in the food chain. Our pals, the photosynthetic plankton, turn sunlight into food for hungry zooplankton, some of which, like krill, feed ever bigger marine predators. So if you liked Finding Nemo, don't thank Disney, don't thank Pixar, thank plankton. Thanks, plankton! Number five, your face. Without plankton, you wouldn't have a face or legs or a gallbladder. What I'm getting at here is that we all kind of evolved from plankton. Back when life was just single cells floating in the ocean, planktonic organisms invented photosynthesis. They invented eating each other. They eventually invented the wonder that is multicellular life, which would eventually lead to us. OK, they didn't technically invent your actual face, but they certainly helped evolution get there. Planks, Thankton! Time for a conclusion. Plankton gives you air to breathe, keeps you warm at night, fuels your car, puts food on the table, led to the evolution of your entire species and doesn't even ask for a favour in return. Plankton's got your back, man. It's always there for you. So take a minute, right now, to appreciate what you've got and say, thanks, Plankton. We love you guys. All right. Awesome. <laughs> um, and for those of you who I, I wrote from, heard from a few people that they were having trouble seeing it, just a couple, um, it will be available on our webpage um, and you can access it there as well for those of you who have questions about it. Um, so Vera, um, I love plankton. They're so cool. Yeah, I me too. I really, I can see why um, you were, you know, motivated to write that letter and get all the way out to Seattle and leave Pennsylvania in your rear view and start working on phytoplankton. <laughs> hey. uh, so let's see, um, Connor and Daniel and um, Duncan all would love to know what is your favorite part of your job? Ah, my favorite part of my job. Well, I have had the chance to go on research cruises with a number of different people, physical oceanographers, chemical oceanographers, biological oceanographers, and then all the ship's crew. And being out at sea and being able to study plankton, being able to study harmful algal blooms is so amazing. Just waking up in the morning, getting a cup of coffee, and just looking out at this vast blue sea is um, just a wonderful part of my job. And because I'm an oceanographer with NOAA, I get to do this every once in a while. Wow, that's super cool. Actually, um, you know, Vera, if you don't mind turning off your slides, we might be able to see you a little bit better. Um, so we could just... Sure, right. Yeah. And then yeah. I'll turn my camera on so it's not just a voice um, from nowhere. Okay, if you just stop sharing, you should be able to do that. Um, let's see, a few folks, and, and you may have covered this, um, want to know, I think we talked about um, whether phytoplankton can be in salt water or fresh water? Uh, yes, so phytoplankton can also be in uh, fresh water and fresh water Phytoplankton are very different sizes and shapes, but they're also there. Um, and that's a whole different field of study. There can, in fact, also be harmful, um, harmful cyanobacteria in freshwater lakes. But again, it's a very, very small proportion of 
the total phytoplankton that are harmful? Um, great. So another question I got was, how many phytoplankton are in a bloom? You talked about blooms. Um, are those, oh, that's better. I can see you perfect. Are those um, millions or thousands? Yeah, that's a really good question. And even scientists don't always agree on what constitutes a bloom, but basically the consensus is about a million cells per liter is a bloom. So a million cells of phytoplankton in a liter of water is the minimum required for a bloom. So that's and a lot. What's a liter? What's something that kids could think of that looks like a liter of water? Liter is basically um, so I guess like a half a gallon of milk. That's a little bit bigger than a liter. So a million phytoplankton in that half gallon of milk. Right. Yeah. Make in, in a bloom. That's a lot. You know, when you were talking about zooplankton wanting to eat the phytoplankton, Rebecca said, so plankton are cannibals. She <laughs> she says and so and then we've gotten a bunch of questions about what plankton eat so it's clear they eat each other sometimes yeah and so what i didn't tell you you know one of the organisms that i showed the one that makes the tomato soup red blooms it can actually eat other phytoplankton it can also photosynthesize and so it has a really diverse range of ways that it can acquire food. So many phytoplankton only photosynthesize. That's the only way they can get their food. But then others can eat other phytoplankton. And this is what's called mixotrophy, okay? So wow. they have mixed ways of feeding, mixotrophy. Wow. So um, Nate asked, um that why that one phytoplankton bloom was white is that because of it was like coccolithophores is that why it was white so that's a really good question and i didn't get into that but basically the way that phytoplankton photosynthesize is by using chloroplasts so they have chlorophyll different types of chlorophyll so in the same way that leaves of trees have different types of chlorophyll that allow them to change color in the fall, for those of you who live in New England, you know it's sort of beautiful, beautiful uh, fall colors. That's because of the changing types of chlorophyll. So each phytoplankton species has different proportions of the different chlorophylls that make them look either reddish or brownish or greenish. And so that's what forms the color of the bloom is the type of chlorophyll that they contain. I see, so it is like leaves. It's just it's like fall leaves, yeah. Um, Nova asks, what's going on with bioluminescent plankton? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. And and the one that is causing these fish kills in California is called ling lingulodinium. And that is a bioluminescent plankton. And so that is a chemical reaction that occurs, bioluminescence. And some of you may know fireflies. It's the same process with fireflies in your yard in the summer that causes them to basically have this light reaction. So there's a chemical reaction that occurs, and sometimes it's because of waves that, that stir up the phytoplankton that causes this light to be emitted. And that process is called bioluminescence. So it's chemical light being, or sorry, chemical reaction being turned into a light. Cool. Um, another good question here from Anna, how does the water temperature affect the amount of phytoplankton? That's a great question, Anna. So what we know is that temperature increases the growth rate of phytoplankton. So basically in warmer temperatures, phytoplankton can grow faster and divide faster and become they can be found in higher numbers when water temperatures are, war are warmer. 
but only up to a threshold, only up to a maximum. If it gets too hot, then the growth rate or their ability to divide and grow will decrease. But in general, we're worried with climate change, with global warming, that it's going to increase the capacity of some of these phytoplankton to make blooms, to grow faster and to do really well. Hmm. Well, that relates to a question that Kathy asked. Do plankton like to stick together? Oh, that's a really good question. So some phytoplankton can form chains. And um, the picture that I showed at the very beginning, you saw some of those round balls. That's Alexandrium. Each cell is sort of a chain of hamburgers. That's what it looks like <laughs> under the microscope. They're attached to one another um, and can sometimes be chains of like 20, 30, 40 cells. It's not completely understood why or how they make these chains, but it will help them float. So it will help them stay in the surface of the water. And that will be important, you guys all know, because they need sunlight. They need to be able to photosynthesize. So by making these chains, it gives them an advantage. They can stay up close to the surface of the water. And that's one of the benefits of forming these chains. Cool, thank you. I like the image of hamburgers. Um, yeah. That sounds pretty funny. Um, do you know when the first plankton was discovered? Oh, wow. So, so we know about the discovery of the microscope and we saw the beautiful images of Ernest Haeckel in the 1900s. So what do you guys think? If he was able to draw those beautiful images in the very early 1900s, the discovery of, of plankton, I mean, we basically needed microscopes to be able to see them. So that happened in the 1800s. And, um, you know, before that, I think people could only really sort of guess at what was in the water. And it's a very interesting area of study. If, if you know, now with all this stuff happening with COVID and so forth, there's a lot of attention being drawn to the importance of microbes in the world. And when we say the word microbe, we just mean something very small has to be viewed with the microscope. And so, at any rate, in the 1800s, I think the study of phytoplankton really started just blowing up, just expanding. Our understanding became so much greater in the 1800s. Wow. So we're still amazing that we know as much as we do in what seems like a relatively short amount of time, considering how long plankton have been around, right? Right. Um, let's see. Uma wants to know, Vera, do you have a favorite plankton? Well, my career has been built on an organism known as Pseudonychia. Hmm. And it's a diatom that can form chains, but it also produces a poison, a toxin. And it's caused problems here on the U.S. West Coast in marine mammals like sea lions. There are a lot of sea lions that get poisoned by this organism because they feed on sardines and anchovies that in turn feed on the plankton. So through bioaccumulation, through the transfer of toxins through the food chain, Pseudonychia causes big problems on this coast. And so I have to say that's been my favorite because it's given me a really nice job. <laughs> Uh, well, you actually uh, queued up with another question um, that someone had asked is, I think it was Sloan that wanted to know, is there a cure for when you get sick from toxic phytoplankton? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And basically, if you are feeling sick after eating shellfish, the best thing to do is go to the hospital. And what they will probably do is put you on fluids, and many of these toxins can be washed through your system very quickly. Um, so there's no antidote right now to any of these toxins, 
but if you just get supportive care in the hospital, fluids, then you'll be okay. Good, that's good to know. A couple of people were worried. Um, Rochelle wants to know, how long do phytoplankton live? Oh, Rochelle, you guys always ask the best questions. Um, so what we know is that, I mean, a single cell will not live that long. A single cell will live less than a week. It will probably be a couple of days. But, but they're basically reproducing, they're cloning themselves, they're producing new cells every, well, the fastest growth rates for diatom is basically one a day or sometimes two a day. So out of one cell, two cells will be formed. And then from that, it just expands like crazy. So a, a, a group of cells can live until basically all the food runs out, until they either don't have sunlight or they don't have other what we call nutrients, food, like nitrogen and so forth. So a, a group of cells can live for weeks and weeks and weeks. Phytoplankton blooms will last in the sea for many weeks, if not months. But a single cell doesn't have a very long lifespan. <laughs> well, it's still, that's, it's interesting that um, they're constantly replicating, constantly, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any favorite, um, so we love the video that we, that we saw, but someone was asking, is there um, a, a fun web pages or um, resources that you can um, direct folks to that we can put on our web page? We have yeah. some up, I believe. Yeah, and we ha I think we have some on the website. Um, I really like doing outreach. We have some cool phytoplankton flashcards. You know, when we get back into business, I would be happy to, you know, send those out. Um, they're, they're cards that basically teach the different types of phytoplankton to kids. You can play, you know, go fish or go phytoplankton and uh, learn about them all. Um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute also has a really good web page on harmful algal blooms. And then I think we have links to our center's website on the um, on this seminar announcement. Great. Well, thanks for mentioning Huey. Um, yeah, we'll make sure that those resources are up on the website for you guys. And um, we can, if you're interested in getting those flashcards, just reach out to myself or Grace Simpkins, however you um, access the webinar, there'll be an email address there for you to contact one of us and we can get those to you. Um, well, Vera, it was so nice to see you. Thanks for getting up early for us um, and, and coming to us from uh, your home and um, just teaching us so much about how beautiful and amazing phytoplankton are. I think I learned a lot and I know everybody else did too. Thank you all for joining and thanks, Nicole. Yeah, thanks. Have a good, have a good week. Yeah, and everybody too. else, we'll see you on Wednesday when we talk to um, Jennifer Stock of the Cordell National Marine Sanctuary about seabirds. So please sign up and we'll see you then. Bye, Vera.